All right, it's a windy, cloudy day, but roasty, toasty, and inside Brewery Sport Gym. Uh, today, we are going to cover our very first non-1776 United mug, because um, we're out. We got 10 of them, and uh, we've used all 10. So I've got this one from Black Rifle that we'll use before I think we uh, recycle some of the mugs. Um, this is a nice little cup of for your hot beverages, uh, it's got black on the outside with the white on the, the right, white ceramic on the inside. That's one thing I miss with those uh, the 1776 um, pottery uh, mugs type is the insides are colored or dark, and you don't get to see the the color of your beverage, the color of the coffee, right? And you, um, as it pours in, it gets darker, and around the edge, you can see a little bit of the tone, the, the lighter hues. Uh, you miss that with those with those bigger ones. So I like that about this one. Uh, it's got the kind of nice matte uh, black finish on the outside. A nice texture there. Um, and uh, two different logos either side. We'll, we'll give you some close-up pictures. I really like that, uh, that bison logo that uh, Black Rifle uses from time to time. Uh, and what we are drinking today is Black Rifle Just Black Coffee. Uh, this is uh, medium roast, 100% um, Arabica bean. Not a whole lot to say about this, except it, uh, most medium roasts are kind of uh, bright in their flavor. This one is, is dark in, in the flavor with the medium roast. So it's, it's nice, it's kind of neutral on the palate, but it's, it's uh, dark, dark and nutty. Um, Kind of a standard standard roast, standard cup of coffee. If you don't want to be too fancy, if your palate's not very developed, this one will be just fine for you right down the middle of the road. Mm. So for today's episode, I want to go kind of have story time, go down uh, memory lane a little bit. We've got new shirts this fall. This is the Make a Hole in the Sky. I'll give you a little turnaround. Right, so we've got new shirts and we, we're going to come out with a new signature series shop book glove here. Uh, people have been after me for a long time to do a glove out of buffalo hide. And I have resisted uh, because part of my design with the shop book gloves is that we don't want them to be too strong. Otherwise, the hand gets too much support. Okay, And yeah, you're going to be able to throw further maybe with the stronger glove. But um, but it's not necessarily the best thing for you when you take the glove off and have to throw the competition ball or a light ball far, right? So part of the genius of my design is that there's there's allotment where your body still has to work and hand still has to be strong even through the glove. So I've resisted the buffalo hide for a while, um, but with the advent of the signature series, it allows us to offer something a little bit special every year. Uh, and this year we decided to do a buffalo hide glove, but we're not just going to do a regular glove. Um, we're going to do something a little different. So what I decided to do was I'm going to learn a new skill. The standard gloves, they get uh, machine stitched. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to hand stitch all of the signature series buffalo hide gloves. Okay. This is needle and thread set you got two needles and i'm going to saddle stitch these suckers uh one by one these are the two prototypes okay this was me learning and designing what the gloves are going to look like okay uh these are probably going to be up on the website within a week or so and they're going to be kind of made to order i'm going to make a few to have on hand but it might be where you once you order i might have to sit down and it might take a few days for me to get out in the mail you know that's another thing that roadie sport does if you're waiting on shipments from some of these big companies most times if you make your order in the morning before my mail truck comes your package is out the same day like i'll have orders come in at 950 by 957 it's boxed up and the mail truck picks it up at 1010 and it's going down the road to your house right we typically keep stock on hand for that reason fast shipping excellent customer service uh these might be a little bit of a delay uh and so just an idea i'll show you a little bit of the process okay um not every glove is perfect and when you're learning you kind of 
We have, you see on the bottom here is two different stitch styles. Okay, we're gonna use the white stitching is gonna be this glove over here. Um, and on this one prototype, we're gonna have our logo is gonna be crossing across the top of this glove here. Uh, and we are going to be bring, usually on the regular gloves, the tab is machine stitched. We're gonna put three rivets in there just to be a little fancier. And sizes are not going to be stamped into the leather. five letters across the, the bottom tab here uh, if you wanted a name or initials on there or something. Uh, so that's that's in the work, uh, in the works. So that'll be available very, very soon, a new signature series glove. Um, again, Buffalo Hide, uh, probably just gonna be larges and mediums. I don't really see females, women needing a glove this strong. It's not gonna make, it's not gonna help you at all. It's probably just larges and mediums. And, uh, uh, I'm excited about it, I, especially because it's, it's even more handmade by me, right? Every product you get from Murray Sport is, I have touched it, I have cut it, I, right? It's uh, from my hands to yours. Now, a little bit of history on the shop book glove, um, the development of it, okay? I was um, having a hard time balancing my training life and working and getting money outside of training. And I kept getting better and better and better in the shop put. And, you know, I would do things like paint fences for people and do some farmhand work and handyman work. And, you know, I had a pickup truck, so I would take loads of junk and yard brush to the dump for people and, uh, you know, take a load the whole thing up, tarp it, take it all the way down to the dump. And because my load was so big, they made me, uh, drive right up on top of the landfill, back up and dump it off. You know, I used to do all that, that kind of stuff when I was training uh, to support myself. And as the years went on, I kept getting better and better. And I, I got to a point where I had thrown, let's see, I threw 2017 in a late summer competition. It was August or September. I threw 2017 and this was in 2011, uh, right before the Olympic year. And I knew that there was more right on the edge. It was it was coming, I was getting better. I was gonna throw close to A standard the next year. And I was, uh, you know, I was uh, trimming somebody's cherry trees, right? Because this is in Camels, British Columbia and they have bears out there and you don't want a lot of fruiting vegetation on your property because the bears will come out of the mountains and, and be in your yard. So here I was, 275 pound, shot putter up in a tree, um, nipping these little branches off and my feet hurt and it was hard to be up there. And my training load was so much that I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Like it was exhausting work to be in this tree, just nipping these branches. And I, I just, I, I said to myself, there's a better way. I can do something while at home and still make money. And uh, that's when I decided we're gonna do the shop with love. I guess my timeline's messed up a little bit. The shop of Glove was in 2010, so. Either way, um, my training, it got to a point where I was training too hard to actually do any physical work outside of training. And I said, the shop of Glove had just saved me. It had just saved my career. I had a severe hand injury in a competition in 2009. And uh, see, I drove like four hours down to Vancouver with the competition. And it was the first time I had to really compete for money. There was a thousand dollars on the line for where I was going to finish. It was either going to be a thousand dollars or three hundred dollars. And at that time, I didn't have money for my next month's rent. Uh, I had no cash. I didn't. I was putting all my groceries and fuel on a credit card, and letting the balance run up. And all of my cash was going to rent. And uh, I had I had no money for rent. And it was due in four days, and my rent was six fifty, and I was at this meet, and second was a thousand dollars, and third was three hundred, and I knew I had to come second. There was no choice other than to come second. I had to get the thousand dollars, and so I threw really hard. I had some great PRs, and um, in the process, I really bent my hand back, and uh, I had severe soft tissue damage uh, deep in my palm.
And so coming out of rehab with that, we uh, uh, trained with the glove exclusively. Uh, let me see, that would have been in May. And I had nationals coming up in July. And so I trained exclusively with the glove. And my the PR was 1944. And I went to the nationals and I took the glove off for the first time in two months. And I threw 1924. Um, broke the hand open again and just all kinds of scar tissue issues. And uh, I went through some very severe uh, therapy after that, I'm trying to get my hand better. Therapy, like we had a, like a wooden, like a T handle wooden dowel and digging it into my hand for 45 minutes straight, things like that um, to get the tissue back to normal. And, and then after that national meet, I threw with the glove again for six months straight. I think it was six months I went, not a single barehanded glove for six months. And this thing saved my career. It, it saved me. It, this put me on the Olympic platform. This put me on a, on a, in a position where I could compete with the world's best in 2012 and 2013. There's no other way I would have been able to throw heavy balls or throw the volume I had without this glove. And I knew if it had helped me so much, maybe it could help the track community. And uh, I set out to make a better glove for myself and it turned out so well that I decided that I would extend this product to the track community. And I had a lot of friends who had, um, had major hand issues, injuries and career ending injuries really. And if they had changed the technique and to not be jumping anymore, okay, that's for another video. If you jump, you break your hand, keep your legs on the ground, you don't have hand injuries. Um, and this would have saved their career. And so now, uh, 10 years of sales all over the globe, and I, every every year I get a bunch of emails, text messages, hey, you saved my season. I wore the glove for the champ up to the championships, took the golf, and I won a PR. Uh, trained through my injury, thank you so much. Uh, so that's a little lineage for those that uh, haven't seen our messages or uh, social posts in the past about the glove. That's kind of where it comes from, and that's what we're doing this year with the uh, the signature series shot put glove. Pretty excited about that. Uh, now let's talk about t-shirts. New t-shirts this season. Uh, in the past, we were using a third party for all of our uh, apparel fulfillment, and now this year we've ended that and we brought it all in house. Okay, I've got a great company I'm working with out of Cleveland, uh, Gannis Gear. And these shirts that we're using are fantastic. They're tri-blend, 50, 25, 25. Uh, we got a custom Rody Sport logo on the inside. They're really soft, stretchy, lightweight, very comfortable. A lot of times I even forget that I'm wearing the shirt. Okay, it's very nice. It's not the average like $7 shirt. Now, uh, there's, we have two designs this year. Let's get these out of the way. Um, I'm wearing the Make a Hole in the Sky t-shirt. Uh, which is an extension from the very first t-shirt we ever did. Before we left for Canada, I'll, I'll give you still pictures of all these uh, splice in the video too. Before I ever left for Canada, I did a, a fundraiser. These are some old shirts, some of them stains and stuff. I did a fundraiser, a t-shirt fundraiser, and this was the first design copied off of an all Ohio t-shirt, uh, very similar that I got from Chris Bassage. And right here in the middle, I have the saying of, in search of the hole in the sky, okay? This was in 2008, right when I left for Kamloops. Uh, I was on a pilgrimage for knowledge. I was going to go and figure out how to throw further. I was going to obtain throws training knowledge that nobody else in North America had from Dr. Bonnerchuk. And, um, this saying, you know, this is the same shirt, slightly different color. I think this was the second run of shirts we sold out. We did a second run. This is a little darker red. This is the nicer one I liked. If anybody sees the old shop put glove video, this is the shirt I'm wearing uh, in that on YouTube. Uh, in search of the hole in the sky. Now for the older generation, they'll probably know exactly where that comes from. Brian Oldfield, uh, younger generation. If you don't know Brian Oldfield, stop the video, go look him up right now. Uh, and he this is a saying that he likened to having really far throws and um he released the ball and he just watched it like go 
into the sky without falling. It just floated away into a hole in the sky. Something to that effect is what, what Brian was talking about. And that really resonated with me of that must be the ultimate transfer of energy. That must be the ultimate um, spiritual experience in throwing. Anybody who's actually thrown far, anybody who's actually mastered their skill. Um, I just got this off of, uh, listen to the podcast, uh, Refined Savage podcast yesterday. He launched, Mark Valenti launched the episode with Sean Donnelly, okay, American Hammer Thrower. And they were talking a little about this mastery of skill, right? Once you master something. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that they throw far. You, you'd be a state champion or a conference champion. But once you get to a level where you've actually thrown as far as your body can possibly throw, right? You've trained for years and years and years. And it's this feeling, this experience that is ethereal, spiritual, out of body um, and that's very, very special. And I think that's where Brian was bringing that hole in the sky from. Now, uh, a few years later, we did um, some more t-shirts. This was the old Rody Throws logo. Okay, very simple logo on the front and a uh, website on the back. RodyThrows.com does not uh, exist anymore. Uh, that's one thing. If I could go back, I probably would just go Rody Sport from the beginning. But uh, then this is the black one. Now this is this is the T-shirt I wore for a lot of my competitions uh, before I was sponsored. Um, I actually threw my lifetime PR twenty one twenty nine five weeks after tearing half my left adductor off my hip bone um, in this T-shirt. And uh, so I was kind of in and out of either trying to attract a Nike sponsorship or having other people interested, but just never really went for it and so I'm you know ultimately I'm glad that I kind of threw my lifetime PR in my own shirt um, because everything was hinged on my own drive right I was given very few handouts in my career um, you know that's something let me get my note card here so I don't forget anything uh, something I want to talk about you know with these shirts and you make a hole in the sky and, and pushing yourself to be a mastery of your craft, mastery of your art, whatever it be, right? Throwing, coffee, leather work, art. Be a master at whatever you want to delve into, okay? And, you know, I was, uh, I was a strong farm kid and I didn't have very much professional or we'll say traditional sport guidance in my development as a youth and so by the time I got to high school I was this I was an explosive muscle strong athlete with no control over my body right I had no basic skill sets of footwork and balance and leverage uh, I could lift a lot of weight but I wasn't lifting with purpose I just naturally knew how to move loads but I didn't know how to move them purposefully for sport and uh, you know, this I ultimately it probably held me back a little bit, and uh, you know, if I had good instruction from the beginning, what would have been the possibility? Now I might have ended up going down a different road or whatnot. You know, maybe that was my path, that was my journey to go through that, find the mecca of information, going to the mountaintop with the master, and learning and. Um, you know, now I can extend that message to the youth, the high schoolers I work with. Uh, you know, and so the other thing about finding track and field, I uh, I guess we're going on a little bit of a tangent here. I don't care. Coffee with Coach Rody story time. Uh, team sports. I didn't like team sports. So I talked with Judd Logan about this last week, and you know he had the same resonance of I mean, football. You know it was a it was a power sport. He was good at it. He was big, fast, strong. But you're always on the hook for everybody else's mistakes. And a lot of throwers, a lot of track and field athletes, they're they're self driven. They're hard workers. They make very few mistakes. And when you're in that team atmosphere, you get punished either by losing the game or by team punishments for the lack of others. 
And I know a lot of high-end throwers, myself included, we didn't stand for that crap. We say, well, if, if I'm not getting the reward for the work I'm putting in, I'm gonna go to another sport where I'm on the line for all my mistakes. I'm on the line for all my successes. And I think that's part of the attraction of track and field. I say continuously, the best people are in track and field. The best people in the world in athletics, in sport, they're in track and field. And I think there's an ultimate honesty with track athletes uh, because you can't hide behind anything, right? Unless you're hiding behind drugs, that's a whole separate issue. Um, you know, I've never used an inhaler and I've never trained an athlete that needed an inhaler. Uh, kind of, you know, um, that honesty portion, you know, but uh, it's, you, you succeed by your own hand and you, and you fail by your own hand and everybody can see it. And it's all measured by painted lines and boundaries and, and tape measures and, and stopwatches. And the results are hard fixed and there's not a whole lot of politics involved in terms of what you actually did during the performance. And uh, you know, I, I, I like that about the sport. I like the honesty that, that it forces people to reveal themselves. And a lot of times you find people with um, self-conscious issues or uh, self-esteem issues. Well, I know that's a bit of a faux pas term these days, but um, when you're out there exposed to everybody alone in the circle, the strong rise and the, and the weak break and fall. And so that's, that's something that's a little bit unique about track and field being an individual sport, uh, especially everything hinging on just a few performances. It's not like a tennis match or a golf match where you have multiple, many, many, many attempts to succeed or fail. In track and field, you have one race, three throws to do your, to, to get it done, right? You're gonna have three misses to get, to get to the next level. Um, so young Justin athlete, didn't have a whole lot of knowledge, had a big strong body, explosive muscle, didn't know how to use it. Uh, we went on this sojourn to find the hole in the sky and ended up, we kept improving, improving, improving. Uh, Anatoly Bonnerchuk would tell me on a regular basis, once I was kind of two or three years into the training, um, he said, he said, Justin, you like Yuri Tam, okay? Bonnerchuk coached three prolific hammer throwers at the same time. It was uh, Yuri Sedek, uh, Sergei Litvinov, and Yuri Tam. And uh, Yuri Tam is the most unknown of the three of those. and. Uh, I, I believe it was Tam that uh, Bonachuk said he came to him young. He was this fat little boy who couldn't do very much. And he's like, here's a program, go home for six months and come back. And he came back and he was a little better. He said, okay, here's a program, go home for six months and come back. And every time he came back, he was better and better until he ultimately was able to join the elite training group with Bonachuk, you know, in the USSR athletes. And every program he gave Yuri Tam, he grew a little bit. Right, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters. But every program he grew a little bit, grew a little bit, grew a little bit over the course of his career. And Bonnerchuk would say to me, he said, you like Tam. I said, me, Justin Rodney, so it's like Yuri Tam. Every program you grow a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And this was over the couple of years, I went from being, you know, a, 18 meter, 17, 18 meter thrower as a senior in college to all of a sudden I was throwing 21 meters and ranked 10th in the world, ranked third in the world. For most of 2013, I ended up being dropping to six because I didn't go compete at Worlds, but um, it's because I had grew a little bit, grew a little bit, grew a little bit all the time. Focus, grinding for years and years and years, honing my technique, being very specific about the the physical preparation, the exercise complexes, nutrition, sleep, everything about my life was centered around getting better as an athlete, which ultimately was obtaining more and more knowledge to be a better coach, okay? And one of the things, when I went to Kamloops the very first day, he said, make glove and no more jumping, right? It was all about bent leg throwing, bent leg throwing. And over the years, um, I ultimately came up with the metaphor. I was the first one to use the metaphor of a catapult and a trebuchet for how to throw. Okay, in the 90s and 2000s, 
lot of people, they had very little time on the ground at the front. Their feet would hit and they'd jump up right away and throw with both feet off the ground. And now you see throwers are landing at the front, staying on the ground a long time, keeping their legs bent and they're throwing the implements, leaving their hand and they've got at least one, if not two feet still on the ground. People did not throw like that in the 90s and the 2000s. People only started throwing like that after the insurgence of bondage checking in North America and the rise of Dylan Armstrong, myself, Tim Netto, okay? Um, when that success happened, then everyone else copied, okay? And now we're seeing the furthest throws in, histories, in history from these technical models, okay? And, and uh, the, I have a lecture on the website, The Return of the Great Rotational Throw Model, and I've got data um, what people were throwing in the 90s and 2000s. They were throwing as far as the athletes are now, they just weren't doing it consistently because they were training, jumping, and on their furthest throws, they accidentally end up staying on the ground, and that's where their far throws are coming from. So um, the average has blown up tremendously in the last four years, and because the average is higher, we're also seeing a small percent of further throws than ever before, right? Because the more, the more far throws you have, the further you can throw. And so that's what we're seeing off of this technical model. Um, of course, that's assuming everybody's on the up and up. Um, so we'll, we'll assume that for the argument and say that it's uh, largely technical based. Now, uh, okay, so I was in search of knowledge. I had a new technique. I came up with a metaphor of trebuchet and catapult. Catapult meaning you, you know, uh, short arm, hard on the rigging, jumping, jerking the body to get your release. And trebuchet meaning keeping your feet solid on the ground and moving your arms a long time around, right? I've got another lecture that talks about that metaphor more extensively. So when designing new shirts for this year, I said, let's do a hole in the sky shirt. Let's take the first shirt in search of the hole in the sky and the original shirt said, I found the hole in the sky. And we ultimately changed that to make a hole in the sky. And that's where you get um, make a hole in the sky with the trebuchet, right? We've got a line of trebuchets launching their rocks downrange, these war machines. Um, so make a hole in the sky, throw far, use the trebuchet model to do it. That is a synopsis of what I achieved in my career, right? A new technique. I really did, I, I feel, extend myself as far as physically possible. Um, without injury, I might have thrown 2170, maybe, um, but that would have been about it. And uh, so that's where the shot clip put gloves come from. That's what the shot put gloves are doing this fall. Uh, that's a little history on the t-shirts and what this year's Make a hole in the sky t-shirt means. Uh, Black rifle mugs, they're not as special and handmade as the 1776 Uniteds, but a good mug nonetheless. Just black coffee. Uh, I'm still waiting. If anybody uh, who made coffee wants to send me some samples, send them to me, I want them because um, I'm having a hard time finding product that's as consistently good as black rifles. So uh, let me know. And until next time, check out No Safe Throws competition, hashtag No Safe Throws, link in the description, and check out Jolly Big Throws Clinic, okay, Jolly Big Throws Clinic. We've got four speakers, all of them have either competed, coached at, uh, gone to as a spouse the Olympics, or attended the Olympics as a friend for another athlete competing. All four have been in, inside an Olympic stadium, some of them too. Uh, it's gonna be a great day. Yeah, check out the registration info. Black Friday's the end of t-shirt guarantee. If you want a clinic t-shirt, you have to register by Black Friday. Otherwise, you may not get one. All right, later.